Okay, thank you very much, Simon, and, and welcome everyone to this webinar um, in support of American Power. Um, so I am in Auckland, New Zealand, um, which is my hometown. So I would say good morning here, but I think for a lot of you, it's maybe afternoon or early evening. So good afternoon or good evening, and thank you very, very much for joining us for this webinar. So as we can see, the session today is going to focus on assessment and motivation. And these are perhaps two words that are not always linked together. So what I'd like to look at today is I'd like first, I'd like to look at formal assessment and progress tests and classroom-based assessment and the way in which these assessment tools can help with student motivation. We'll look at different kinds of assessment and a little bit of terminology associated with assessment. And then I'd like to focus more specifically on the relationship between assessment and learning, because this is often where motivation becomes quite important. And in doing this, we'll look at what's known as learning-oriented assessment, LOA. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, don't worry, I will give a, a, a clear definition of what this involves a little bit later on in the webinar. But I'd like to begin with a task. So this is a kind of a scenario that I've often been presented with. You have a learner who's perhaps midway through a course at B1 plus level, intermediate level. And she comes to you and she says that she's lacking motivation. She doesn't sort of feel very motivated with about her English study and not very enthusiastic. And in effect, she feels that she has lost interest in English. Now, into the chat, um, what I'd like you to do is type what you might say to this learner. What would you suggest to her? What would you say to her to help her with her motivation? So I'll just open the chat um, and see if you can type some messages. So this, um, in my context, is, is quite a common scenario. Um, where students have kind of reached what is known as the intermediate plateau. So obviously, when you begin studying English um, at elementary level, you often make a lot of progress. And that is you know, exciting and motivating. And then you reach you know, this intermediate plateau where you feel, as a learner, you can do things well enough, but you don't feel that you're making much headway um, with the um, with your progress. So no messages as yet. Okay, lovely. Some nice suggestions. Focusing on what you're interested in, what the learner might be interested in. Absolutely. the kind of activities that the learner might want to do. Okay, yeah, good. A nice comment about thinking about the person's back background, their learning background. Okay, and ideas for activities. Needs analysis. Good. Yeah, vocabulary for the different, um, for, the, for the age group. Fantastic. They're really, yeah, good ideas. This is, oops, where are we? So these are some of the things that I would do, which you've really kind of already mentioned in, in the chat. Um, so I would definitely have a tutorial with the, the learner. I would perhaps talk to her maybe a little bit about um, classroom issues, classroom dynamics. Um, often it can be things to do with how the learner is getting on with their peers, um, or it could be something to do with classroom management, the kind of interaction patterns that you have. So the learner might feel that, you know, I, the teacher, am talking too much, or she might feel there's too much pair work or something along those lines. Um, a lot of you have um, 
mentioned materials and resources, the kind of activities and materials that the learner um, is using and whether these reflect their personal interests or not. So the materials could be the materials that you're using in class, but they might also be materials that you are suggesting for independent study. So when the student is actually studying outside the classroom. Then a lot of you have mentioned the idea of needs analysis. And obviously this is often tied in with long-term and short-term goals. So I think that this is quite a, a useful thing to, to focus on with learners is considering what their goals are, because this often has a direct relationship with their motivation. So in terms of talking to a learner about goals, I would begin with the um, their reasons for studying English. Now, we may have discussed this early on in the course, we may not, but I think it's always good to go back and to remind yourself and just to get the learner to talk about their goals because often they do change. So their reason could be, um, for example, just for travel, but it could be to get a better job or it could be because they want to study at an English medium university. Another thing to consider is the students' aspirations in learning English. Now, aspirations are a little bit different from goals or reasons for studying because often <clears throat> they're concerned with the kind of dream that the learner has in terms of maybe what they could do one day um, using English. So an aspiration could be something like, one day I want to be able to give a TED talk in English, something along those lines. Now, I think it's important to think about those things and to remind the student of those things because that kind of dream aspirational thing often can be a way of motivating students. The other thing obviously is to talk about goals. Um, now, goals can be either long-term or short-term and it's often short-term goals that are problematic when it comes to motivation. And the reason is this, you, you will often say to a learner, so what, what are your goals in speaking English? And their answer will be, I wanna speak English like you. Now, if they're at B1 level and you're a fluent speaker of English, there could be quite a distance between what you can do and what they're able to do. So often I find it really can help if you can pin down some achievable learning objectives for learners. So, you know, at B1 level, it might be, you know, being able to talk about your family, your friends, your daily life, to be able to talk about past events of your life and things that you want to do in the future. So that's a little bit more simpler um, and a little bit more straightforward than being able to speak really fluently, almost like a native speaker. Then the other thing that can sometimes help, and this particularly is I think the case when the learner is at B1 plus level at intermediate level, is perhaps to consider doing some kind of examination as a tangible goal. So, so in effect, um, what this means is that assessment is one of the tools that we have in our motivational toolkit. It's one of the things that we can kind of offer students to help motivate them. So because doing an exam means that the learner does have a very specific and very clear learning objective for a period of time. So if we're thinking about assessment, it can be either formative or summative. So let's just have a look at what we mean by these two terms, formative and summative. If we're going to consider assessment a little bit more broadly as, in a, as a motivational tool. So Glenn Fulcher defines formative assessment as it's designed to play a role in the teaching and learning process rather than to certify ultimate achievement. So in effect, what he's saying here, this is the kind of assessment that we might do on perhaps a less formal basis. It could be progress tests perhaps um, that we do at the end of a two week period or something along those lines, rather than kind of an end of course exam to say that you know, you've achieved this level and you can move on to the next level. So he contrasts that with summative assessment, 
He says this measures proficiency at the end of a period of study, by which time learners are expected to have reached a particular standard. So these are the kinds of tests or exams that we give learners at the end of a course. And often we're wanting to check that they've actually learned enough in order perhaps to pass to the next level, or perhaps um, it could be a more formal examination like IELTS or Cambridge B2 first. Okay, so these terms are quite frequently used when we're talking about assessment. So I'd like to have a look at these five examples of assessment. And I'd like you to think about, you don't need to write or do anything, just think for a moment, whether these are examples of formative assessment or summative assessment. So number one, an end of week revision test. Number two, Cambridge B2 first exam. Number three, end of course achievement test. Number four, a role play to assess if students have learned a language point. And number five, a placement test. So just think for a moment, would you say that these are formative or summative? So I'll just pause for 20 seconds or so, so you can think about that. Okay, so these were my thoughts on, on these assessments, these kinds of assessment, these examples. I think that numbers two, three, and four are fairly clear. So numbers two and three are, are clear examples of summative assessment. And number four, I think, is a very clear example of formative assessment. But I think it gets a little bit trickier with examples one and five, because it will kind of depend how you view the tests and the context in which the test is happening. So an end of week revision test. Now, if you know that there's going to be like um, mid course competency tests and end of course um, exam and end of course exam, well, an end of week, end of week revision test arguably is an example of formative assessment. However, if it is a kind of a genuine attempt by the teacher to really check all the language that has been studied in that week, you could actually also argue that it's the end of a period of study, it's the end of the week, so therefore it is summative. So you can actually, I think, see it both ways. And likewise, number five, a placement test, and this is the kind of test that learners normally do when they first start at an institution in order to determine their level. So you could say that it is formative in the sense it gives an idea of what the student does and more importantly, what they don't know. Uh, so this helps us determine what they will need to study and what would be an appropriate level for them to study at. But you could also argue that it's summative in the sense that it kind of is testing everything that the learner has learned up until that point. So I think that what some of these examples show is that these two terms can be a little bit slippery. So Jones and Saville wonder whether summative and formative kind of present a false dichotomy in some, in some way. And their preference is to make a distinction between classroom assessment on one hand and formal large scale assessment on the other hand. And they know that both should, in their words, contribute to the, t, the two key purposes of assessment, to provide evidence of learning and evidence for learning. So evidence of learning, clearly there is a kind of a summative um, dimension to that, but also, all kinds of tests, both formative and summative, can provide us with evidence for learning. So in other words, it tells us what learners don't know, and it tells us what we can focus on. And obviously, I think this, um, in terms of if we think back to goal setting and having short term achievable goals, the evidence for learning is very, very useful information. So this idea of 
assessment providing evidence for learning or promoting learning in some way, it has a lot of terms associated with it. Um, so it's sometimes referred to as classroom-based assessment. It's sometimes more generally called assessment for learning or dynamic assessment. It can also be called integrated learning and assessment. And the other term is learning oriented assessment, LOA. So this is the term that I will use when in discussing assessment that promotes learning for the rest of the webinar. So let's just have a look at LOA and exactly what it means, what we mean by this term. So in effect, it sees that informal classroom assessment and progress tests and formal large scale assessment as complementing each other. So it's not making this kind of dichotomy distinction to say between formative and summative, it's saying that they all complement and reflect each other in some way. And what it, the key thing that it does is that it links assessment to the developing needs of learners. So, and I think this is, again, this is where motivation is really important because if learners are aware of their needs and I've got tangible specific goals that can help enormously with motivation. The other key thing about learning oriented assessment is that it does acknowledge our judgment as teachers, the kind of daily evaluation that we do of learners and saying that this actually has weight and has a, a space in terms of the overall assessment profile of a learner. So I, what I like about LOA is it acknowledges our voices, our thoughts, our opinions of teachers in terms of the evaluation that we make of learners. So that this is why I'm, I'm particularly keen on it. So if we consider assessment and motivation quite broadly, we can say that assessment is an effective way to determine and prioritize learning needs. So using these different assessment instruments, short-term tests, classroom-based assessment, and even formal tests, that will give us information about learners' needs. And this, in turn, can um, provide us with some specific goals. Now, it can do this in two ways. I mean, in the obvious way that we first looked at, whereby you suggest to a learner that they do an exam and they follow a course of study to that exam in order to have a tangible goal. But in less formal assessment, where we're just determining learning needs, it will help us set short-term study goals. So this is what you need to work on for the next two or three months. Now, usually when we focus on goals in that way, or if students are doing exams, in my experience, it does tend to encourage students to do a little bit more by way of independent study. I mean, often as teachers, we're often trying to encourage students to study independently and get the message across that, you know, in the classroom, we can't do everything, that, you know, they've got to take some responsibility for their learning journey. Um, so assessment and setting these goals is some way of actually encouraging students to engage with independent study. Summative assessment also um, is a way for learners to benchmark themselves according to some kind of international standard, like the Council of Europe Framework of Reference. So these levels of A2, B1, B2, et cetera. So for some students, that's important, that like being able to find out where they lie um, in, a, in a scale and to be able to benchmark themselves. So that can be quite motivating. If you suggest to a learner that they do follow a course of study that leads to an exam and they sit the exam and they pass it, well, obviously that gives them an enormous sense of accomplishment and achievement. And, and that obviously is, is very motivating for them. And then finally, often a lot of assessment um, exams like IELTS or Cambridge Advance, they will actually open a gate for learners because they will allow them to do something, for example, here in New Zealand, in order to study at a university in here in New Zealand, you need to have an IELTS score of maybe six or 6.5, it would depend on the faculty. So achieving that result in the exam means that the gate to um, go to university opens for the learners. And again, that is a powerful motivating tool. There are, of course, 
some points that we do need to consider in terms of using assessment as a motivating tool. Um, but for some students, the whole idea of assessment and examinations can be a little bit stressful, particularly if it's a high stakes test. That often does depend on the individual student and the student's perception of the test. Um, they often create the stress for themselves. Um, but often if it is an important test where say for IELTS because they need to get into university, um, well then obviously that could be a little bit stressful for them. If you're working in a context where there are weekly tests and the test scores are seen as being very important. So learners feel that they have this constant pressure on them um, to get a good score in the weekly test. Obviously that could be a little bit stressful for some learners. Another point to consider um, if learners are following a course that leads to an exam, there is the concern that they might study just for the test and they don't actually develop their overall language competence. Now, in general, it is far better for learners to focus on their language competence. They're more likely to do well in an examination or a test if they do that rather than study for the test itself. I mean, obviously they do need to be familiar with the test and the examination and the different um, testing tasks and that they know how to use those appropriately, but they do need to also focus on their overall competence. It can encourage a little bit by way of rote learning where learners are kind of learning endless lists of irregular verbs or long, long lists of vocabulary because I think if they know lots of words, they'll be able to get through the examination. But often this rote learning doesn't take into consideration things like how that vocabulary is used in context, what the register is, the collocations, all that kind of thing. So too much rote learning is not necessarily beneficial, but for some reason exams tend to encourage this. And then obviously some assessment tasks don't suit learners' preferences. So for example, a lot of examinations will have, a, say, a grammar transformation activity, which certain learners may not like those. So that is a kind of a, a downside. So I'm not saying these are reasons for not doing tests or engaging in um, assessment in some kind. I think that these are just things that we need to bear in mind when we are assessing students um, a little bit more. They're things to bear in mind and manage and be sensitive to. So for the rest of the webinar, I'd like to look at some specific areas associated with assessment and the way in which motivation can be important or the way in which um, the, the assessment activity can help motivate students. Some very specific examples. And I'm going to start off by looking at progress tests. Then I'm going to move on and look in more depth at learning oriented assessment and the ways in which that can motivate students. And then I'd like to finish by looking at the kind of feedback that we give to learners after they've done some kind of assessment. So let's begin with progress tests. Um, and there's this really nice quote here from a, a noise, a teacher in um, Spain, where she's talking about progress testing that she has done. And she says, when I needed to grade my students, I had to learn how to put together tests, how to develop marking schemes and how best to use them. My colleagues had the same problem I had. They had limited literacy on testing and assessment. Our tests were basically the result of cutting and pasting from different exam examples or from published tests and textbooks. Now, when I read this comment, um, I immediately identified, um, identified with it because this is exactly what I have done. Now, I think like noise, I have got limited literacy on testing and assessment. I think I know enough um, to know what the issues are, but my literacy is not such that I'm able to write a test. I'm not a, a test item writer. I don't have that level of knowledge or literacy in terms of testing and assessment. And I used to do exactly what Noyce did, and that was cut and paste. And I was always worried about how valid and reliable the these progress tests were. 
I was never, I never felt sure. Um, and also, again, I struggled with things, as she says here, like developing marking schemes and arriving at a suitable kind of score for learners on the basis of all of this. So this was a source of some frustration for me. Um, so what I'd like to look at is the way in which digital tools can actually take away some of the stress associated with progress testing. So some of our stress, but also the way in which these, this digital approach to assessment can also help with learner motivation. Now, with Empower, there is a whole digital assessment package that comes with the course, which manages uh, the progress testing um, in, in the package itself and takes a lot of stress off you. So I'll just show you one or two example screens. So this is available on um, Cambridge One. Um, so it's something that students, you the teacher and the students will ha have access if you're using uh, American Empower. So after students finish a unit, you the teacher can open the progress test for them. So you have control of that. They can't just dive in and do it whenever they want. They can only do it once you actually make it available to them. And they do the progress test in their own time. So what you can see here is the result that a learner has got having done the unit three progress test. So this is represented here as a percentage. So they got 75% in all five assessment tasks. And the learner can be given an even more detailed breakdown and they can find out what they got wrong and what they got right. So this learner got numbers, questions one to six correct, but they got seven and eight wrong. Then, as you can see here on this pull down menu, the second item where it says view recommended practice, on the basis of the problems that the learner had with the particular question, they then click on this and this directs the learners to some practice activity that revises the issues that they got wrong and gives them further practice. So students do this before they attempt the test for a second time. So one of the benefits of um, this kind of digital approach to testing with progress testing is the fact that the tests have been created by Cambridge assessment specialists. So you don't need to worry about whether they're valid and reliable. They have been trialed and tested and they are. And the other thing is they are immediately available. available. So as soon as you finish a unit in the course book, you can open the test. So this ensures systematic revision. And obviously, um, the one thing that is invaluable is the fact that they can be done as independent learning. So often when you want to do a progress test, you have to set aside an hour or maybe an hour and a half of class time in order for students to do the test. Whereas these can be done by the students in their own time. And of course, you, the teacher, can monitor whether they have done them or not. The other issue, of course, with the, um, you know, the way in which we've had, we've all had to work in the past two years, when you move to online learning, as um, most people had to do around the world, well, then the, these tests are there online ready to go. So it makes management of that, if you're having to teach online, very, very straightforward and easy. But the other uh, thing that I like about it most of all, I think, is the fact that if students get answers wrong, it directs them to online activities, practice material that focus on the things that they got wrong, and it deals with their specific needs. So that when they do the test a second time, they're more likely to succeed. So how does this help with student motivation, this digital approach to progress tests? Well, the first thing is it gives the students immediate feedback. And I know that as a learner myself, if I sit a test, I usually want to know fairly quickly how well I've done. You know, what did I get right? What did I get wrong? What's my score? So obviously these digital tests give learners immediate feedback and it does show them exactly what they did get right and what they got wrong. 
And as I've indicated, they do have two attempts. Now, when they do the test for a second time, they only redo the things that they got wrong. So all of the questions they got right, they kind of bank those. And so they just have another go at the things that they didn't get right first time round. Now, in all the trialing that we've done of this digital um, uh, assessment package, what happens is students always get a better score. They always get something right, usually quite a lot more right on the second attempt. So then obviously this results in a higher score in the second attempt. And that is clearly very, very motivating for students. And it gives them a very definite sense of making progress. So this shows how the progress test delivered online and using a digital package can really help. Well, first of all, they have make, makes our professional life a lot easier and frees up a lot of time in terms of having to worry about progress tests. But it can also be very motivating for students because they get this immediate feedback and the sense of making progress. So now let's move on and have a look at language oriented assessment in the classroom and ways in which this can help with motivation. So as we've noted before, LOA does center around the kind of ongoing spontaneous assessment that we um, do with our learners. Now, this is often implicit and explicit, and I think it happens all the time. I mean, as a teacher, I think that we, we kind of automatically go into assessment mode as soon as we step into a classroom. We're constantly thinking about our learners and thinking, oh, did they understand that? Oh, I think, oh, she was very slow to read that. I don't think he understood much of that listening. Mm, there were a lot of grammar mistakes there. Her fluency is really good. Oh, that's nice pronunciation. We're thinking and making those judgments all the time about our learners in our head. So this actually is all in effect, in effect classroom-based assessment. Um, I think it's, it's kind of an automatic, spontaneous um, uh, activity that, that, that we undertake as teachers. This activity reinforces the more formal means of assessment. So LOA is acknowledging the relationship between this implicit assessment that we're doing all the time and the more formal progress tests or mid-course tests or end-of-course tests that we might be doing. Often LOA is expressed in a kind of a task cycle. So I'd like to show you what I mean by that. So often in order to evaluate um, if learners are able to use some specific language, we will give them some kind of communicative task. We will watch them carry out the task and we will make note of our interpretation of how they're going with the task. And also we might also record some specific examples of language or behavior um, that we've noted, good examples or things that perhaps need correcting. On the basis of our interpretation and what we've noted down, we'll make some kind of decision about what we're going to do next. We would give feedback to learners. Now, if learners have done the task really well, we will just perhaps praise them and say, you did that really well. And perhaps there's some examples of some um, good examples of language or and then we would move on to something new or alternatively we might feel that we might do a little bit of error correction and then on the basis of our interpretation we will modify our objectives so we might say okay let's move on to something new or we might think mm, i think i need to revise this um tomorrow or in a couple of days and often we're going round and round in this kind of um, evaluative task cycle now, the two areas where I think motivation is important if we look at this LOA task cycle is in the task that we provide learners and then secondly, in the feedback that we give them. So I think there are, there are opportunities to tap into students' motivation or to try and motivate students um, in these two areas of the LOA task cycle. So let's have a look at what I mean by that. So looking at tasks, they need to be communicative. Um, so they need to provide learners with opportunities to 
produced language. So if we're interested in a specific area of language, it, the nature of the task should be such that if you gave it to two very fluent speakers of English, they would automatically use that target language without necessarily thinking about it. The task needs to be interesting. So this is something that a lot of you mentioned in the chat before when we're talking about motivation for the learners. It's really important to actually provide tasks that reflect the kind of topics and activities that students are in interested in. So I think that is really, really important. It also does help to vary the task type because obviously students, different students have different learning preferences. So some students like doing role plays, some students prefer discussions, whereas other students perhaps prefer problem solving activities. So we need to do all of those because we need to try and cater for all the different learning preferences in, in our class. So it does help if you vary the, the task type. But I think a key thing here is making sure that the task is manageable and that the level of challenge is appropriate to the level that you're teaching. So Black and Williams say that a task where the challenge goes too far can lead to student avoidance of the risks involved. And for students who are far behind, it is difficult to encourage their efforts without at the same time making them aware of how far behind they are. So this is the issue of um, providing students with tasks that are too difficult. So in effect, they'll avoid trying to use perhaps the language we want to evaluate and assess, or they will just feel it's too hard and it's too difficult. And they'll kind of, they'll have this sense that they're, you know, they're behind everybody else, they're not making progress. And this clearly is going to have a very detrimental effect on their motivation. So this idea of manageable challenge, I think is really important when we're considering these LOA tasks. So now let's look at feedback, the kind of feedback we give to learners um, when they've worked on a task. It can be immediate or it can be delayed. So if it's immediate, we would probably give learners some kind of feedback as they are working on the task. Maybe, you know, we might sort of inter interrupt them in the middle of a role play very, very quickly. If it's delayed, we, will, we can either wait until after they've completed the activity, or indeed we might wait until the end of the week in order to give feedback. Um, that will depend you know, on the time that we have available and the, the kind of feedback we want to give and why we want to give that feedback. So if we're going to give immediate feedback, Clearly, we don't want to have a negative effect on learners' motivation. So we need to be clear in the way that we give feedback, but we also need to be supportive and constructive. So we don't want to you know, jump in and say, oh, you didn't do that well, or you got that wrong. So we need to perhaps um, prompt a little bit um, or maybe pose a question in some way. So what we're focusing on here are some very specific teaching skills associated with correction, error correction techniques, and the kind of questioning of learners that we might do. We might sort of go, going to or will, or are we talking about the past or the present, that kind of thing. And I think it does help to vary the kind of um, techniques. So we might just prompt learners or using meta language, say using grammar terminology, or another possibility is to recast. Now, recasting means that we just repeat what the learner said, the, the error, but we just re repeat it correctly. It's kind of like echoing them to some, de some degree, but using correct language. And often learners will pick up on this. So these are all ways of managing immediate feedback trying to be supportive and constructive in the way in which we do it, using questioning um, and prompting techniques. Now, delayed feedback, there is much more uh, possibility of variety with delayed feedback. It can be oral, but it can also be written. We can give learners written feedback. And we can provide it after classroom-based tasks. 
But we can also provide delayed feedback after progress tests and also after summative tests. Now, <clears throat> Harlan and Crick make some quite make a quite pertinent point here when they say that when we provide feedback to students, it needs to be about the performance in a way that is non-ego involving and non-judgmental. So they're emphasizing here performance, responding to that, what students have said and done, rather than it being about the student. So I've got another task here, and um, the way in which we'll manage this is I'll get you to vote in a poll. I'm going to show you three examples of um, delayed written feedback. And I'd like you to read the three examples. I'll show you the three slides. And then at the end of that, um, we'll open the poll and I'd like you to vote for example one, example two, or example three. So let's start. This is example one. So the feedback reads, sometimes I found it difficult to understand what you're saying and so did your partner. You really need to work on pronouncing your final consonant. For example, words like left, first, month. You need to say these clearly. Your grammar was fine. So that's example one. I'll just pause for a moment if you want to read it for a second time. Okay, so example two, your speaking is so much more confident now and you communicate really well. Your grammar is quite accurate. Just think about your pronunciation. Keep working on your English, you're doing well. It's so good to see. Again, I'll just pause briefly. And example three. Your fluency has improved and you use the present perfect well in the discussion. Sometimes you were a bit hard to understand because you weren't pronouncing final consonants. There are lessons in English pronunciation and use intermediate that can help you. Okay, so those are three examples. So if we could open the poll and um, if you can vote. So, So I'm not sure if I should be able to see the results or not. I can't at the moment. Ah, fantastic. Okay, so the most popular option um, seems to have been example three. Um, and that, I have to say, is the example that I prefer. Um, why do I prefer example three? Um, it, first of all, it acknowledges some strengths, um, and it obviously is referring perhaps to previous issues. Your fluency has improved, so obviously that has perhaps been a problem in the past. And it also acknowledges that the student is using present perfect well. Sometimes you were a bit hard to understand because of final, so it does indicate a learning need, and then it does provide an opportunity uh, for students to use the material, to find some material that's going to help them with that. Now, example one was good in the sense that it provided detail and it provided some specific examples, but there was not much there that was positive. There was just the final comment that says, your grammar's fine. But I thought that that was rather vague. It, was a, it didn't give a, a, the learner a clear idea of what was good about their grammar. Example two, obviously, is very encouraging. So that is always nice for learners. But I don't think it gives them anything to work with. And let's say that, you know, there were some issues um, during the assessment and the learner knows that if they see that 
phrase, they will kind of be perhaps a little bit confused. So I think, you know, it, it's, it wasn't quite as balanced as it could have been. So in terms of thinking about how we can structure feedback, I mean, this could be oral feedback, but also written feedback. I think it's good to, first of all, comment on the learner's achievement, something that they've done well. And it's nice if you can perhaps refer to some previous problems or needs that they've had or some specific assessment criteria, which have been an issue for that learner. Then I think it's good if you can highlight on one or two needs. I mean, normally perhaps two. Um, the example I gave had only one, but that is largely to do with the fact that you can only get so much on a slide. Um, I could only really um, fit one need on the slide. But I think normally when I'm giving feedback to learners, I would include a couple of needs. And then if you can make some kind of practical suggestion or re refer students to some kind of resource, that is going to help them address the problem. I think that this can be a useful way, a useful template of how you structure feedback to learners after some kind of assessment. Now, we looked at example two, and, and one of the issues I sort of said that there's perhaps a little bit too much praise there. And I think it is, I mean, praise clearly can be motivating. Um, you know, we do want to be encouraging to learners. But I think you do need to manage it carefully, and it is possible to overpraise. As I mentioned, I think learners often do know when they've done a task well or if they've not done it well. Now, if they clearly feel that they've not done it well and we praise them, there's the risk that they can think that we're being insincere and even maybe a little bit patronizing. The other issue, of course, with praise is that it does tend to focus on the learner's self-esteem rather than task achievement. So Black and William make this um, suggestion or the, 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 this comment that giving praise can have bad effects, particularly when it's not linked to objective feedback about the work. So I'm not saying don't praise learners. I think praise is important, but I do think you need to manage it carefully and balance it with, as they suggest here, objective feedback about the work, about the language that learners have produced um, in the task. So then finally, um, often with summative um, assessments, this is often the time when we are giving feedback to learners. And again, that can be quite time consuming and there are now digital tools that can help us manage all of that and they're kind of like time-saving devices to some degree. So with the Empower Assessment Package, there are two what we probably call more summative kind of tests, a mid-course test and an end-of-course test. These are competency tests that learners do. Now these tests are skills-based, so there's a reading, a listening, a writing and a speaking test. So Le the, the reading, listening and writing tests are automatically marked by the software. So uh, this probably is a kind of a, a welcome message for a lot of you. Um, no more um, marking of writing students' um, written tests. Um, the other thing is the reading and the listening are just done and you get a, you get a score. So this saves us an enormous amount of marking time. The speaking tests, we still need to manage. They're available on Cambridge One as part of the Empower Assessment Package. And we carry these out face-to-face -face with our students, or we could arguably do them online. They can be done online. There are instructions on how to conduct the test, and there's training for teachers who are not familiar with how to do a speaking test. The other thing, there is an option to record it, and this is something that I would recommend. Um, in fact, for the past five years or so, I have always, with my students' permission, of course, I've actually always recorded any kind of speaking tests I've done. I've just used my mobile phone because I usually find that I can't pick up everything when I'm actually conducting the speaking tests because I'm trying to ask questions, trying to listen to, to their language. But, you know, I'm, I'm clearly having to focus on other things. And I find it really helps if I can go back and listen to their speaking a second time. I can um, more easily pick up their needs and what I can give them feedback on. The other nice thing is with these um, summative tests, um, 
is it, they do translate into a CFR score and a level of competence. So the student would get a report which shows where they lie in relation to their level. So for a student who's been studying an A2 level, they may get a result like this, which shows that they've definitely met A2 level and they're edging towards good performance. They would also get a breakdown of how they've done in each individual skill, which is useful to know. So this clearly shows that this learner has got needs in terms of reading. So they do need to practice reading skills. And also um, there is an option for them to do um, uh, a more formal test, lingua skill, which is something that learners can book for and do online. The other thing is that Empower is um, a very good course book in terms of preparing students who are interested in doing a lingua skill test. Okay, so we have got to the end. So just to sum up, we've looked at formative and summative assessment. I mean, these terms are useful, but do be um, aware of the fact that they are a little bit slippery and they're not necessarily a, a dichotomy. We've looked at the way that formal assessment can motivate because it um, can provide a very tangible goal for learners. We've looked at progress tests and how these new digitally managed progress tests can be motivated, motivating the students because they target improvement and they give students a sense of progress. And obviously they also make our, um, our professional lives a little bit more straightforward in terms of managing assessment. We've looked at learning oriented assessment and the way in which it motivates by determining learners needs and setting goals. And then also we've looked at the way in which feedback can motivate students. So broadly speaking, assessment is one of the tools that we can use to help with student motivation. It's not the only tool, but it can be quite a useful and powerful tool. So we've looked at it in a general sense that it can provide a tangible goal. But when we look at individual ways of assessing students, progress tests, LOA, et cetera, within those activities, there are also ways in which we can help learners' motivation. And I think a key thing is this idea of assessment for learning, that assessment is a way of working out what learners' needs are and providing them with tangible, manageable, achievable learning goals. So thank you very much for um, listening and um, hopefully there will be some questions for me to look at um, in the chat. Thanks a lot for that. Yeah, very clear and lots of uh, content there to, th to think about, I guess, uh, for the teachers. And yeah, I definitely remember, as you, as you said, you know, um, cutting and pasting questions together for different books mm -hmm. for the end of week test. Um, I remember doing that uh, quite a few years ago now. If you have any questions, uh, please, uh, put them in the Q&A box and I'll, I'll put them to Craig. I think there's only one in there at the minute. Um, let me read that one out. Might as well start with this one. So it's from Nicola and she asks, how would you deal with parental uh, or peer teacher pushback on either testing outside of class time or on a more formative style of assessment? Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so if there is significant pushback, say, from parents about, um, uh, it, I guess it depends on what they're pushing back on. So they may push back in two ways. Um, they, may, they, they may have concerns about the fact that students are doing this online, can they cheat? Um, so there is very limited opportunity, I think, for students to cheat. And there's also, um, I think there's a mechanism within the digital um, package where you can actually see how long a learner spent on um, an assessment task. So if you can see that a learner, if you the teacher can see that a learner has spent two hours on two questions, well then obviously um, you will need to talk to that learner. There could have been something, you know, there could have been something along those lines. Um, so I, I, the fact that there is this ability to monitor students in that way, and there's a lot that you can track I think should be reassuring for, for parents. 
if they're pushing back because they're worried about their their son or daughter um, spending too much time online, um, obviously that's something that you would perhaps need to negotiate. I mean, I think one of the points to make to parents is that there is only so much that can be achieved in a classroom. Um, you know, and, and if their child is going to make progress in English, you cannot do it all in the kind of time that you have available that might be just three hours a week. And that, you know, it has to be a kind of a, a shared responsibility between the teacher and the learner. And that really their, their child is not going to make progress unless some outside time is, is devoted. And that this kind of, that, that the testing, the assessment package has, you know, if you can frame it as assessment for learning and having a revision function um, and the, the importance that that has in, in terms of students learning, I think that's one um, way that you can, you can push back. And I mean, in terms of your peers, I would make the same arguments really to, to your peers in the sense that, you know, um, is to emphasize this idea of assessment for learning, of determining learners' needs and being able to then set really specific learning goals for students and to kind of target their learning, both for individuals, but also for a group, because often assessment instruments will, okay, they'll reveal things for individual learners, but they will also indicate patterns within a group where um, you, you can often say, okay, this group actually, they're all having a problem with the present perfect or you know, the vast majority are, et cetera. So those are the kinds of arguments that I would put to, um, yeah, to put to teachers who have got that kind of, um, yeah, uh, those kinds of concerns or, or, or issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I guess if you're testing, uh, there is a, it can be a bit daunting for some students, but if you're introducing regular testing, I, I guess it becomes commonplace, it becomes quite normal, the anxieties uh, melt away, have you, yeah, have you found exactly. that in your experience? Yeah, indeed. Um, and the, also the, the other thing is that if you actually, sometimes if you avoid the T word test um, and, and actually just say, okay, let's just check your progress and do a little bit of revision, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can frame it in that way. I mean, at the school that I um, have been working at, we test our students every four weeks. Um, and we actually asked students if they wanted to change to every six weeks, but they said, no, 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 every four weeks. But you... But as soon as you say there's going to be a test on Monday, they sort of, yeah. you know, they, they look pale um, <laughs> and, you know, you completely ruin their weekend um, by, by telling them there's going to be a test on Monday because they said they, but, you know, when we sort of said, well, we can take away some of that stress and um, they didn't want it. So there's a, a sort of a strange irony there, which um, I, I don't in, entirely get. But as soon as you mention the T word test, um, you know, this is when they would sort of start shaking and turn pale, not all of them, but, you know, sort of one or two of them. But if you actually, you know, the way in which you talk about, you know, talk about evaluation rather than assessment, talk about progress and revision rather than test, the kind of terminology that we use around um, testing often does have negative connotations for, for some learners and just the way in which we talk about it can perhaps help. How are you feeding back? Are you feeding back on a, on a more individual basis or do you maybe make it a group activity or? I do both, in fact. So it, often um, I will, when, when we would do these four weeks tests, um, I would often sort of notice a pattern that, you know, everyone was having um, a problem maybe with a certain sort of lexical set mm -hmm. that perhaps was included in the test. So I wouldn't give individual feedback on that. I would actually then just give a general comment and say, mm, I noticed in the test everyone was having a problem with this, and then do some kind of revision activity. But at my school, we were, we well, were because I'm not working there at the moment. Um, the schools are all closed in New Zealand because nobody can get into New Zealand at the moment. But, um, but mm. what we um, used to do is um, we would write a report, the kind of feedback report that I showed you in the seminar, we would write um, a brief individualized report for students um, 
after the, the, the progress test. So indicating you know, strengths and weaknesses and often suggesting something that they would need to, need to do. Um, so this was part of the, the, the kind of assessment program that, that we had. Excellent. We, we could continue, but we are, we are over time actually. Um, and I do want to, to mention, I think you have another webinar coming up uh, in a month's time. So if you've enjoyed this today, That's right. Um, yeah, thanks for the very much for the session today. Thank you everybody for, for joining us wherever you are. Um, so we hope you can join us for the, for the next one, which is on the 20th of April. Um, I think uh, the link to register for that one has been put in the chat box along with your link to the certificate of attendance. Um, so Craig will be speaking again on uh, rising to students learning challenges. Um, so yeah, we hope to we hope to see you again soon. Um, just looking at the comments coming through i think there's a lot of thank yous there uh, for you craig so uh, have a, have a good rest of the day i know it's uh, still early morning for you um, i should be going to bed pretty soon it is indeed. Um, yes so uh, yeah have a good rest of the day and we'll, we'll hopefully see everyone else again uh, at that next webinar thank you very much thank you thank you simon and thank you everyone for for joining us today